Okay, uh, let's get this started. In H.G. Wells' The Time Machine, he describes a world populated by two races. The LOI live above ground in a garden paradise, and the Morlocks toil beneath the earth to serve the LOI. But sometimes at night, they come up and eat the LOI. And this can and has been used as a metaphor for all sorts of things, but I like to think of it as a story about knowledge and innocence. The LOI live in a paradise they don't fully understand, and sometimes what they don't know comes up and bites them. And as software engineers, this should sound familiar, because we build on foundations that we don't understand. We sit atop 60 years of accreted abstractions. And when we start out, we try to dig down, we try to understand, but at some point we have to realize that first principles are not within reach. At some point we have to be content with what we know and build upwards. And so, from the beginning of our education, we're taught ways to cope with this, to deal with the fact that we don't understand the systems, that we can't understand the systems that we build in their entirety. And chief among them is the hierarchy, or the tree. And the tree has some very specific invariants, very specific relationships that are allowed. That of parent and child, and that of siblings. And with the siblings, it's notable that they are only connected through their parent. They have no direct relationship. They can be considered in isolation from each other. We can decompose the problem. We can divide and conquer it. And for some problems, this is a completely accurate representation of the problem space. If we're trying to play tic-tac-toe, the game space of all possible games is a tree. It starts with an empty board at the root and goes down with moves and counter moves but I would expect that no one in this audience writes game AIs for a living. And so the systems that we build look more like this. They have components and subcomponents, and they're connected in sort of varied, subtle ways. And of course, we still treat them as a hierarchy. Here, if you ignore all the dotted lines, then it's still something that can be decomposed. It still has pieces that can be considered in isolation, but we only got here by choosing to ignore things, by telling ourselves that uh, they don't matter for the problem that we're trying to solve. And so we spend a lot of our time pretending that these two things are the same. And of course they're not. That's a, a polite fiction, right? That's a, a story that we tell ourselves. And it's a necessary story because otherwise we can't make progress. We build systems that we can't understand fully. But sometimes it's easy for us to forget that this is a story. It's easy for us to forget that the model that we have is not the world as it actually is. And we're not alone in this. We can go and look at something like scientific forestry, as it was invented in the Prussian Empire in the 1860s. And scientific forestry is roughly the process of going from this to this. And the reason that they tried this was because the Prussian Empire needed lumber. They needed to build ships and other things. And forests, which they had many of, were not necessarily very efficient at producing lumber. There were lots of trees that didn't make useful lumber, that grew too slowly. And also the forests were very irregular. They didn't have a sort of uh, predictable layout, and so the only way that they could estimate the yield of a forest was to survey the entire thing. And so their solution to this was very straightforward. They discovered which tree grew the fastest, produced the most lumber, and they planted them in regular rows so that they could look at a subset of the forest and extrapolate the state of the rest of the forest without ever having to look at it. And at first, this was very successful. The trees had record yields. They got the lumber that they needed. But over time, the nutrients that had been put in the soil by the previous forest, the previous ecosystem that existed there, were used up. And so the trees began to grow stunted, and diseases hit the monoculture that they had planted, and the forest died out altogether. And so one really straightforward conclusion we can make from this is that forests are complicated, right? Forests are not just the trees. But I think a more interesting uh, sort of thing to think about here is the perspective of the bureaucrats somewhere in the heart of the Prussian Empire that had an idea of a forest as a means of producing lumber. He didn't think of a forest as a uh, shelter or home for wildlife, or as a means of producing medicinal herbs or lumber for the nearby villages. He thought of it as a means of producing uh, just wood, wood to build ships. And when he went and saw the forest, understood that his model was not the forest as it actually was, his response was not to create a more complex, a more nuanced model. It was to make the world conform to his understanding of it. And at this point, 
Many of you may, may be wondering what this talk is actually about and why you're here. And before I get to that, I want to define a word that we use a lot, which is uh, a system, right? We build systems. The forest is an ecosystem. And there's no one true uh, definition of this, but one that I like is from Gerald Weinberg's An Introduction to General Systems Thinking. And he defines a space with two axes. Complexity is how many moving pieces there are. And randomness is a degree to which they are all independent of each other. And he points out that anything which is sufficiently uh, simple and sufficiently structured on, or non-random can be formally analyzed. We can understand it as, in its entirety. And anything which is sufficiently random, where all the sort of actors are moving independently of each other, we can use statistical analysis, kind of independent of how many moving parts there are. But there's a very large gap in between where neither of these approaches are sufficient. And so this is where what Weinberg calls systems thinking is required, where we need what he calls heuristic devices, which are a lossy way of looking at the world. They are an effective model, but not a true model, right? There are things that we ignore. There are things that we sort of blind ourselves to in an attempt to understand the system. But the point that he makes is that heuristic devices don't tell you when to stop. No model, which is simplified, acknowledges there is something outside of itself. The forest as a means of producing lumber does not acknowledge that there are other uses for a forest. And this is something that we wrestle with, right? These heuristic devices, they are the medium that we use to make systems, to make software. The source code and the frameworks and the libraries, these are parts of it. But really what we wrestle with on a daily basis, I'd argue, is the inherent trade-offs here, choosing what to ignore and what to pay attention to. And if we look at what we do from that perspective, there's not just the last 60 years of computer science that we can learn from, there's the last several millennia's worth of human thought because everything that we build eventually exceeds our ability to understand it. And so this is a problem that we see repeated over and over again. This is something that people have written about at length. And so what I want to talk about here are other places where people have wrestled with this problem and some of the pitfalls and some of the approaches that they've looked at in the hope that this will sort of inform uh, what you do for a living, not directly, but indirectly. And so we begin with mid-century critical theory, which was a roughly the sort of attempt to take the works of Karl Marx and Sigmund Freud and use them as dual lenses to understand all of human thought. It was a very sweeping sort of uh, grand vision of uh, analysis. And like most things that are grand and sweeping, it had logical holes you could drive a truck through, which uh, led to these two guys, Gilles Deleuze and Felix Guattari, uh, sort of pointing these things out. And Deleuze and Guattari were the first postmodern critical theorists. And most of you who have heard of postmodern uh, critical theory have probably heard of it as something which is slightly ridiculous. It's hard to tell whether or not it's one big practical joke. And it is hard to understand. I think that there is definitely substance underneath all the prose, but one excerpt from uh, A Thousand Plateaus, which is a book written by Deleuze and Guattari, reads, the layers are the strata. They come in pairs, one serving as substratum for the other. The surface of stratification is a machinic assemblage distinct from the strata. The assemblage is between two layers, between two strata. On one side, it faces a strata. In this direction, the assemblage is an interstratum. But on the other side, faces something else, the body without organs or plane of consistency. Here, it is a metastratum. And I could probably take the rest of this talk and try to explain to you what this passage means. I might even get it right. But uh, the essence of what they write about is not uh, really tied up in the language. The essence is this recurring theme that they talk about, which is the interplay between the state and the nomad where the state is something that tries to sit atop the world, to understand it, to control it. And it does this by establishing hierarchies, because hierarchies are the only tool we have to understand something as big as the world. And in trying to model the world, it also tries to make the world conform to its simplistic model. Conversely, the nomad is someone who tries to understand the world as it is, but only locally, only a little bit at a time. And they talk about the rhizome, or things which are rhizomatic. A rhizome is a biological term for an organism which is connected at the roots. They seem sort of disconnected, but underneath, they are all one big organism. 
Andalus and Guattari talk about the interplay between rhizomatic structures and arborescent or tree-like structures. And if they were computer scientists instead of French critical theorists, they might have just called these trees and graphs, right? But the point that they make is that the things that we call trees, the things which we use hierarchies for, are often just degenerate views of the world as it actually is. They are lossy. And this is crucial, right? This is, again, a pattern that we see repeated over and over again. And if this sounds interesting, um, I would not recommend that you begin with uh, A Thousand Plateaus. It's an interesting book. It's a rewarding book as you kind of go through it the second time, but the first time is a bit of a slog. And so instead, I'd actually suggest someone else who uh, I think is much more approachable. Jorge Luis Borges was an Argentine librarian in the early 20th century, and he wrote short stories about infinity, about taking an idea and sort of stretching it to its extreme until it breaks down in fun and interesting ways. And one of his stories is a paragraph. Uh, it's one of my favorites. It's called On Exactitude and Science, and it reads, in that empire, the art of cartography attained such perfection that the map of a single province occupied the entirety of a city and the map of the empire, the entirety of a province. In time, those unconscionable maps no longer satisfied, and the Cartographer's Guild struck a map of the empire whose size was that of the empire, and which coincided point for point with it. The following generations, who were not so fond of the study of cartography as their forebears had been, saw that the vast map was useless, and not without some pitilessness was it that they delivered it up to the inclemencies of sun and winters. In the deserts of the west still today, there are tattered ruins of that map, inhabited by animals and beggars, in all the land, there is no other relic of the disciplines of geography. Who here has heard the phrase, the map is not the territory? Okay, so that's basically saying what this story says at greater length, right? We use maps because they are reductive. This is why you can have a book full, an atlas full of maps that to show the same place, but in different ways, right? They take one facet of the world and they raise it above all the others. And what this means is that as we sort of asymptotically approach a map that describes the world in all of its nuances, it ceases to be useful, right? It, it no longer describes the world in a way which we find more approachable than the world. But at the same time, as we become more reductive, as we create a map which has less and less detail, we also find that the utility of this map sort of falls off very rapidly. And so the equilibrium between these two things is what we're searching for, and it's very hard to find. It's very mired in what we're trying to do with the map. And yet, it's very easy for us to believe that the map is the territory, right? We, we interact with our maps so much more often than we interact with the world itself. And so we lose sight of this. And we can, again, look at uh, the sort of school of modern urban design, which began in the 1860s with Baron Haussmann's redesign of Paris, where he tore down the slums and built these structures, which are now iconic, like the Arc de Triomphe. And the reason that they tore down the slums was in part because the slums were crowded and unhealthy and unsightly. But it was also because the slums were so dense that they could effectively wall themselves off from the rest of the city. They were impossible to control. They could seed from the city within the city. And so they tore down the slums and they replaced them with these big wide roads which could not be walled off, which allowed the city and the government to project force into the city. And you see here that the roads radiate outwards from the Arc de Triomphe. This is something that we see time and time again in modern urban design here. This is the theoretical garden city, which at the center has the central city, which is responsible for the administration. And like spokes around it are a lot of other specialized cities, which deal with specific ne uh, needs. And in between, there's a huge amount of open space because the urban designers in this school felt like the people left to their own devices would inevitably ruin the city. They would build everywhere. They would fill all the open space, all the available space. And so they felt it was their job to save the people from themselves, to give them a rational design that they could not find uh, emergently. Uh, one of the most visible members of the school was a French furniture designer and amateur city planner named Le Cabousier, who submitted this sketch to the new Soviet Union in 1920 as a idea for the new center of Moscow. These large buildings here are called super blocks. They are where everyone is required to live. And due to the economies of this scale, the efficiencies of this scale, there's room for huge amounts of wide open space in between. And you'll notice that this looks nothing like Moscow, it has no real uh, sense of the Russian culture that preceded it. And this is by design, 
Uh, Le Corbusier had no concern for the context. For him, good planning was good planning, which is why when the Russians turned him down, a few years later he scratched out the labels and submitted it to the city of Paris as a new city center. Uh, a more successful attempt at creating a rational city was uh, the construction of Brasilia as the new government center in Brazil in the 1960s. Uh, the contract for the design was awarded on the basis of this sketch alone, which shows a vertical axis where all the government buildings would be, and two outstretched wings where all the super blocks would be. And because they, again, they controlled where everyone would live, they could build arteries, these great big highways that would allow for efficient transit. They controlled everything because everything was constructed in advance of there even being a population. And so they built it. And after they were done, uh, a few things happened. All of the uh, workers who were brought from all over the country to construct the city had no place in the city. They were not part of the plan. And so they were forced to settle on the outskirts of the city, which had no affordances, had no power, had no plumbing, no sewage, no roads because the city had not anticipated people living outside of its plans. This was not an extensible city. But even the people who were allowed to live there uh, reported a feeling of disconnection. Look at this wide open space here and notice that there are no people. This is because the spaces are not for people. This, the spaces are a declaration of control, of power, of uh, the mastery of the plan. And so they reported uh, this feeling, which they called Brasilite, or roughly Brasiliitis, the, the syndrome of living in Brasilia. And while this remains the government center, it is, to this day, uh, vastly underpopulated. A more successful uh, attempt to kind of deal with these uh, ideas comes from Christopher Alexander, who was a planner and architect who wrote two books called uh, A Timeless Way of Building and a Pattern Language, where he attempted to describe something that he felt was good about certain buildings that he found. And he called this the quality without a name because there was no one word that really encompassed it. But he said that it was alive and whole and comfortable and free, exact, egoless, and eternal. And notice that some of these are sort of at tension with each other. It's hard for something to be both free and exact be both alive and eternal. These are not dimensions that we can simply move up and to the right on and find this quality. This is a balance that must be struck. And Alexander was very careful to say that this is something which is wholly contextual. He says it is never twice the same because it always takes its shape from the particular place in which it, occur <clears throat> Excuse me, in which it occurs. And so you can't take a house that has this quality and move it a mile down the road or move it uh, halfway across the world and expect it to retain this quality. This is something which uh, is uh, ephemeral, which is not sort of uh, reducible. And so when he talks about it, he does not talk in terms of pieces of homes. He talks in terms of their totality. At the beginning of A Timeless Way of Building, he says the first thing that comes to mind when he talks about the quality without a name is a cottage in the British countryside. And he says, the wall runs east to west, the peach tree grows flat against the southern side. The sun shines on the tree, and as it warms the bricks behind the tree, the warm bricks themselves warm the peaches on the tree. It has a slightly dozy quality. The tree, carefully tied to grow flat against the wall, warming the bricks, the peaches growing in the sun, the wild grass growing around the roots of the tree, and the angle where the earth and roots and wall all meet. And so there's a, a wholeness to this, a holistic quality to this. It is not easily reduced, but of course we're software people, and so we did. Uh, at the height of the uh, sort of popularity of Alexander's ideas, uh, some people got together and wanted to come up with what uh, the design patterns, what this sort of would uh, lead to this quality in software, and they called it the Design Patterns book. It's a gang of four books. It's very well known and was for a time very popular, but it misses something crucial in that it tries to give you Lego blocks. It does not talk about the context. It does not talk about the particularities of your problem. It presents itself as a collection of universal constructs, which is not at all what Alexander was trying to communicate. Um, a more successful, I think, attempt to distill Alexander's thoughts come from, comes from uh, Richard Gabriel, who is one of the authors of the Common List spec, 
uh, was the founder of one of the AI companies back in the 80s before the AI winter killed them all. After that, he became or went to get his MFA in poetry, and now he writes poetry and writes software that writes poetry. And he wrote a book called Patterns of Software, in which he attempts to talk about what the quality without a name for software is. And it's a very short book. Uh, I highly recommend it. But a theme that he returns to over and over again is the idea of habitability. Habitability is the degree to which you can take a code base that you did not write and make it your own, adapt to changing circumstances. Because that is the only sort of guarantee, right? Brasilia thought that it could plan a city that would be eternal, that would never need to change, but there's always a reductiveness to our plans. There's always something which we think we can ignore, which we can't. And there is a fragility to the expectation that things will never change. There is uh, an unpleasantness to code bases that force us to stay within these very tight strictures, these assumptions which have long since been invalidated. And so, uh, I think that when we look at these sorts of things, when we look at all these past plans, all these past assumptions, that is maybe one of the largest lessons that we can learn, is that we're always going to be wrong eventually, and we should plan for that. And so, we've gone through a lot of different examples, sort of skimmed over their surface. And I don't expect that all of you will necessarily be uh, convinced that the things that I've talked about are relevant to your day-to-day -day sort of jobs. But I do want to just introduce one more idea, which is that the Greeks had two words for knowledge. Uh, they had a word, techne, which meant knowledge, and it meant timeless knowledge. It was the Pythagorean theorem. It was the harmony of the spheres. It was things which were true outside of the world. And this is a root for technology, right? This is, this is the sort of word that underpins this. But there's another word, uh, metisse, which also means knowledge, but it means cunning. It mean, it's the thing that allowed Odysseus to fool the Cyclops. It's the thing that allows you to walk down your hallway in the dark and not trip over anything. If we transplant you to some other hallway in the dark, you will not be able to do that, right? This is mired in the specifics of your experience. And when we're in school, we're taught the mathematics of computing. We are taught things which are universal. But when we actually begin to perform our job, Nothing is universal. Everything depends. Everything is uh, dependent on the domain, on your knowledge of the domain. And when we make decisions, we do not make decisions which are provably right. We follow our intuition. We make choices which will be wrong. And we try to fold that back into our experience, try to further inform our intuition. And so my hope here is not that learning about city planning or the advent of scientific forestry will somehow let you write better code in a completely direct way, but that it will inform your intuition, that it will give you a vocabulary with which to discuss these things. And so, there are some books that I've read that have resonated for me. And I'll, I'll post this uh, a little bit later, uh, but a few that I'll call out are um, Invisible Cities, which is by Italo Calvino. It's a work of fiction. It's probably my favorite work of fiction. And uh, it describes cities, uh, just a few pages each chapter, different cities, which are all facets of the same city, Venice. And it becomes clear as it sort of goes on that these are all sort of pieces which come together as a whole, which is more than the sum of its parts. Uh, seeing like a state is where a lot of my historical examples came from. It talks about the interplay between governments that want and need control and the sort of ways in which that affects the people who live in the world as it actually is. And Data and Reality is a really interesting one uh, that was written in the late 70s, back when SQL was sort of uh, on the rise. It was written by uh, a research scientist at IBM, and it is a very readable, very practical analysis of some of the shortcomings of relational modeling. And uh, I th think that is probably one of the more directly relevant uh, books on this list. And with that, we have quite a bit of time left for questions. Well, uh, so the question was, uh, how do these sorts of ideas go into working with other people who may not have read the same things or be familiar with the same concepts? And I think that many of these concepts are not necessarily uh, immediately obvious, but they're not that hard. To say that a code base is habitable, I think, that, that it feels comfortable to live in, that it's something that you could make your own, that's not hard to explain, right? 
uh, it may not be immediately apparent to someone that that's an important thing to have. That's a much broader conversation, and I'm not necessarily going to be able to prove that I'm right, or even be right, that that's a thing to optimize for. But that's a, it's a word, it's, a, it's some vocabulary that you can sort of contribute. It's a thing that you can introduce into a conversation and sort of call back to in future conversations once we all agree that we sort of understand what that means. And so I don't like go to everybody that I work with and hand them a stack of books and say, talk to me once you finish these, right? That's not going to happen. But I think that you can, you know, do your own reading, have your own ideas, and then try to communicate that, right? That's actually a really important piece of understanding something is the degree to which you can communicate those ideas to someone who has not uh, gone as deep on these things as you have. And, you know, you're going to succeed, you're going to fail, um, but I think that, again, that's, that's part of the value. You, you can enrich these conversations, you can uh, try to encourage people to look at it from different perspectives. Yes? Sure, yeah, the question was, are there any scientific approach, or, sorry, software approaches that sort of uh, resonate with this. Um, in my day-to-day -day job, I use uh, Clojure, which is uh, a Lisp and has a REPL, and you generally develop things sort of from the bottom up. You, you make small pieces, bring them together, sort of a, make sure that everything works as expected, and then sort of build upwards from there. And uh, I think that that arguably uh, makes it easier to not at the outset, say, here's the center of the world, and then build forward with that from, as the sort of you know, primary assumption, right? It becomes much easier to create something which is loosely coupled, which allows you to change where your center of the world is when you do that. And that's something that I think is uh, easier to do in Clojure because that's just sort of the general approach which is encouraged, but by no means is it limited to you know, lists or even REPL-based languages. I think that that's just uh, a thing that you can do. Emergency, like the emergence property, yes. I, I don't think I can say anything particularly uh, broadly true about that. The, the question was, you know, how do you deal with the fact that circumstances change and that, you know, anything that you make will become obsolete due to changing circumstances? Is that about right? Okay. I mean, I think the only insight I can give there, which is not much of an insight, is that things will become obsolete, right? And uh, if you have a framework, for instance, right, the sort of definition of a framework is that it calls your code for you, right? Which means that fundamentally this is the skeleton by which you've, you've structured everything. Uh, that, depending on sort of how it's structured, can or cannot be easy to change, right? It may be that that is just sort of this calcified structure that defines all the code around it. All the code has to sort of glom on to the available points. And I think that uh, people often, so there, there's sort of this interesting pattern you see on, you know, places like Hacker News where people will say, you know, I use this for one project and I use it for another project, which is slightly different. And so just by sort of projecting that outwards, right, uh, then it works for everything. Right? It, it, that's just inductively, that must be true. And I think that, you know, there are always boundaries to the utility of anything, right? Because they're lossy, because they make certain assumptions about the world. And I think that in a lot of documentation, you see people talk about, this thing is great, it's great for this. But very rarely do you see someone saying, and here's where it breaks down. This is the boundaries. This is where you should not use this. And I'd really like to see more of that, right? More of people saying that something is good for one thing and bad for another thing, and not having that be sort of the reverse induction, where if it's bad for this, it must be bad for everything, because only uh, a, a good abstraction must be perfect for all possible applications. And so I think that there's a, a conversation that can be had there, which would be very productive, where when you're kind of trying to figure out obsolescence, or if you're trying to map out where things might go, that you understand which of your tools are going to fail should you take a particular path. And that's okay, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't use it, it just means that you should be aware that that's something that can happen and you can you know, plan for that uh, eventuality. Uh, I don't think anyone else, so uh, thank you. <laughs>